Welcome once again to Dialogue on Public Issues. I'm John Chowning with Campbellsville University. My guest today is Dr. Lewis Brogdon, a very uh, qualified and outstanding academician, uh, author, pastor, speaker, preacher, and uh, making his second visit here to Campbellsville University and second appearance on our show. Dr. Brogdon, welcome. I'm glad to be here. Thank you so much for taking time from what is very busy schedule on your part. Well, well, you know, I came to Campbellsville a couple years ago. Yes. Uh, it was a wonderful experience, and so I've actually been looking forward to returning for quite some time. Uh, so it'll be a busy month for me, but I'm getting the month started off the right, right. way being here. Uh, absolutely. And, and I might just mention to our audience that uh, you mentioned earlier during your visit that you were launching this particular series of appearances uh, at Campbellsville University, and you'll be ending where? The month? At the University of Massachusetts, Boston. Well, w I think that's pretty good company for, for we're glad that Matt, Matt UMass Boston could join Campbellsville and follow Campbellsville's oh, leadership. Yes, absolutely. You, you have a very uh, distinguished background, a, a lot uh, you've accomplished during your career. Tell us a little bit about your, uh, your, your career path and your experience, just so our uh, audience has uh, uh, some knowledge of the breadth of your experience and all that you've done. So I've spent 26 years uh, being in, in Christian ministry. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm an ordained minister. Mm -hmm. I'm duly ordained in both the Baptist church as well as the, uh, the Pentecostal church. Okay. So I grew up in the, uh, the Pentecostal tradition, uh, but then made my way into the Baptist church okay. uh, because of theological education and, mm -hmm. and that's the direction God led me in. Mm -hmm. And then about a third, halfway through there, you know, I went into the academy. So mm -hmm. I pursued my MDiv and completed my PhD and have just had a wonderful uh, career mm -hmm. uh, as an educator and as a scholar. Over time, I've come to realize that where I was really used to, you know, pastoring, weddings, funerals, right. conventions, that Christian ministry can work in, in a lot of different ways. Certainly. So I've really grown into the ministry of a scholar, the ministry mm -hmm. uh, of a teacher. And so I'm afforded the opportunity to teach in the classroom. Uh, mm. And I really believe in the power uh, of the classroom. I, I believe it's very, very sacred that you have that space that God gives you to really uh, impact minds. So when you're in the classroom, you're impacting people who are they're there for a reason, and then you're preparing them for something else. But God has also given me wonderful opportunities to also teach people who are current practitioners. Mm -hmm. So I spend a lot of time traveling across the country, uh, speaking in conventions, workshops, uh, for people who are already doing this work uh, and I have opportunities to kind of help them to really think through what it means to mm -hmm. uh, to be more effective what are some of the issues they need to be aware of how to reframe some of you know what may be a challenge could be an opportunity right uh, so I love that so mm -hmm. I love that I get to teach students in the classroom but also professionals uh, across the country I love writing so I'm a, I'm a big nerd I've written <laughs> uh, seven books Wow and I have uh, two more books that, that are in, in the hopper, uh, outstanding projects. Uh, I also have a new column in the magazine called Black Politics Today, mm. and, my, and my column is entitled The Black Pulpit and the Public Square, because mm. what it gives attention to is the role that black clergy should play in speaking to issues outside of the four walls of their church. Mm -hmm. So that column is, is an opportunity for black pastors to kind of do some mm -hmm. of that work. So I'm really, really uh, proud of that. So I love writing. Writing is a, is a form of a ministry. Indeed. That a lot of times people can read your something that you wrote, and then that's going to open up a door for you know, follow-up mm -hmm. conversations so mm -hmm. that people can understand some things with some more depth. Uh, I was invited to the White House under, uh, under Obama to uh, learn about his initiative, My Brother's Keeper. I lectured in Jerusalem. Those are just some of the highlights of, sure. a, of, a, of an outstanding career, which is why my life verse is Ephesians 3.20. Mm. This says, now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we could ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Mm -hmm. and, and God has done that, He's taken this poor kid from um, the West Virginia, Virginia area, from nowhere out of the projects, and I went to the White House and lectured in Jerusalem, and I'm being interviewed Mm -hmm. you know, by an administrator of a very uh, prestigious university in, this, in the state of Kentucky. So I'm very thankful. 
Well, you, you have certainly been blessed and certainly have a, a lot of accomplishments. What, what would you call to be the focal point now, where you are now in your career, in your ministry, and your teaching, and your writing? What is kind of the focal point, uh, the central calling, if you will, of that ministry? You know, and I'll, I'll, I'll probably touch on this same issue sure, you know, sure. with, with some other questions. But I just really think it's important that we open our eyes to the, to the fullness of the world around mm. us. So one of, um, one of Jesus' most, most notable miracles is always opening the eyes of the blind. Mm -hmm. And so beyond that being a, a, a literal thing where Jesus healed someone like you know, Bartimaeus, that's also a metaphor of what the gospel, what God wants to do in the gospel, to really open our eyes so that we see not only ourselves, but the world around us uh, more fully. And so I have a tremendous amount of passion around trying to help people to just look around. I think society tries to insulate and to isolate us from just the profound suffering. There's mm. just so much suffering and death that we've almost that we're either trying to hide from or we become immune to and I'm trying to use some of the Christian disciplines and practices mm -hmm. and the teachings of the Bible to sensitize us to these things to not accept that this is God's vision for this world. Okay. Now you will delve into some questions that that we've talked about in advance of this interview but you touched on the work you're doing with the uh, black politics uh, uh, radio uh, or magazine, yeah, uh, and that you are focusing on the connection between the, the black uh, pulpit and pastor and uh, participation or connection with the political uh, dynamics of the day. What I what is that correlation? You know, there there are those who criticize ministers and uh, the church for being engaged in the political arena. Yet that is a part of the tradition. Yes. within the black church. Yes. Uh, comment on that, what you, how you see that in general. We don't have time to delve into it in its details and nuances, but in general, what is that role in today's uh, context? Well, if you think historically about you know, the, the black experience, mm -hmm. I mean, we had a form of religion that had to speak to the whole uh, of black life. I mean, we were enslaved for 246 years. Mm -hmm. So we couldn't have a religion that didn't address the elephant in the room, which was slavery. Mm -hmm. And slavery was something that was, um, was a legal institution, a, yes. a legal practice. So the only way to upend the system of slavery was to have to engage in the political. So that's always been a part of the, right. of the black religious tradition. But what I'm trying to do with this, with this column is there's been a retreat uh, in the black church, or out of the public square and out mm -hmm. of political issues. In the Old Testament, what some of the shrewd kings would do is they would, um, they would get what's called court prophets. They would hire their own prophets, mm -hmm. put them on staff. Mm -hmm. They would basically tell them what they wanted to hear. And there's been a lot of that where you're seeing, it, regardless whether it's Republican or Democrat, you're seeing clergy being used mm -hmm. by the political machinery and so what I'm trying to do is to encourage clergy to reclaim um, the prophetic tradition mm -hmm. and to reclaim the moral and spiritual authority that we have as first representatives okay. of God. And that's what we can't compromise. And, we can, and while we may have party affiliations, mm -hmm. though they're, they're going to be secondary mm -hmm. to, of course, our, uh, our allegiance to Christ. So I have a new article that's coming out that's okay. really trying to tease out that we must have dual uh, alliances. You mm -hmm. give to Caesar what's Caesar's, you give to God, mm -hmm. you know, what belongs to God. And then creating space for other black pastors to talk about issues because these are issues their members are bringing into their mm -hmm. churches that affect, you know, the lives of the people they feel called to minister to. Mm -hmm. and, some, uh, and sometimes you just can't pray for something. Right. Sometimes it's a policy that, that needs to change. So maybe you need to talk to a mayor mm. or a city council. Mm -hmm. So the political doesn't have to always be something that's negative. Right. It's really ultimately about trying to make people's lives mm -hmm. better. Okay, very good. 
What do you consider to be the number one issue confronting the church today in, in, in the United States first and then globally and then related to that as believers, how should we approach those issues, those concerns? Yeah. There's a passage of uh, scripture out of First John um, where John says, if you see your brother in need and you shut up the bowels of compassion, how can you say th the love of God dwells in you? Mm. And so, and, and, and this is the point I, I said earlier I was going to circle back around to. There are a lot of people who are suffering uh, in, in America. I'm talking about mass suffering and mass death. Mm -hmm. And we almost closed off, um, you know, what the, the New Testament calls your bowels of, of compassion. The, the Greek word splagna. I mean, it's, you know, it's the core of who you are. Yes. The core of who you are should care about um, if people don't have enough food to eat, um, if they don't have um, housing, if they're not living somewhere this safe, if, if they're destitute, you, you name it. We, so, we have so insulated and isolated ourselves against that that we, we don't want to look at it. We drive by, we see people sleeping under a bridge. And there are texts in the New Testament that challenge us to understand that person we just drove by could be Jesus. Because mm -hmm. Jesus said in Matthew 25, the same as you've done it for the least of one of these is the same as you've done it unto me. So there, there are certain texts in the Bible that really make it hard to be indifferent. Right. and to keep looking away. But how the, how the institutional religion of Christianity has functioned, it's conditioned us to do that very thing, mm -hmm. to either look away or to explain away why it's okay for that to happen. And what has really brought that to the fore has been my study of the, of the history of slavery mm. uh, and the civil rights movement, is that you, most Christians were not on the right side of history. Mm -hmm. so, you're talking about very small groups of people fighting to abolish slavery, small groups of people fighting to dismantle uh, Jim Crow segregation, and then having masses who are just kind of sitting on the sidelines, spectating, not wanting to be involved. And those are the Christians I'm feeling called to, to kind of challenge because I'm not sure if they really understand the depth of the biblical tradition mm -hmm. that God does take sides and God does care about human suffering. Mm -hmm. And I believe that undercurrent is what's fueling the disconnect and the complete fallout of the millions of people who, uh, according to Barna's research, are what's called uh, unchurched. Right. They used to go to right. church, but you know, they, they don't go. Now they still believe in God, they still believe mm -hmm. in the Bible, still believe in Jesus, but there's something about the church. And a piece of that has been that you're having these m masses of people who are suffering, but the church is not talking about it. Mm -hmm. We're talking about other things. So how do we not do away with what we're talking about, but how do we bring human suffering? Because it's something that God cares about. How do we bring that into Christian preaching, Christian theology, and even Christian worship so that we open our eyes to what's going on around us? Mm -hmm. Do you think that is primarily the Western church or the global church in general? That, that condition? I think it's, uh, and I'm really thinking particularly about, about Christianity in, in America. Mm -hmm. the, the, it, it's a real okay. problem okay. we have. And, I, and I, really, I really feel that it's the problem that the church in America ha, you know, mm -hmm. has to really come to grips mm -hmm. with um, because I, I really believe it, it can lead to the collapse of American Christianity. Not the collapse of Christianity, right, but this right. institutional form as we know. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we have to make some significant have, changes. Have Ameri has the American church adequately, in your opinion, Dr. Brogdon, dealt with the reality, the truth, that most all denominations, in some form or fashion, at some point in their history, sanctioned slavery? and or Jim Crow segregation. Have they dealt with that? Have they adequately dealt with that heritage and that sin? No. <coughs> there have been some who are willing to admit it, mm -hmm. um, but then when it's time to ask serious questions about how we should respond 
mm -hmm. as Christians, right? Then I mean the responses have, have been pretty shameful. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've been doing some uh, uh, some some lectures on on the issue of reparations in uh, in white churches in Louisville mm -hmm. for the past couple of months. And it's just been an, a, a wonderful experience and an opportunity to, that God has given me to talk about a very controversial issue that right. then when the audience hears it, they had all of these crazy ideas about an issue that then once it's reframed, they're like, that makes, that makes complete sense. Mm -hmm. and, a, and a key piece to that is the role Christianity has always played in that. Mm -hmm. And that now other educational institutions are thinking about what they're going to do about this history, and they've already started to make some kind of proposals and recommendations. Uh, churches are, are still, you know, talking about those things, mm -hmm. and, that, and that's a pretty typical pattern uh, that we haven't really wanted to address the role of Christianity in, in slavery and, and genocide. Mm -hmm. Do you think uh, the influence of the Christian faith, you've touched on this, but I, I want to delve into it a little more is increasing or decreasing in the United States and then around the world. Yeah. <coughs> I think I think faith and spirituality are are vibrant. Mhm. Mm but institutional religion is declining and collapsing all around us. Mm -hmm. So it's a very odd and interesting time uh, mm -hmm. to be alive because lots of people are talking about they believe in God, they're people of faith and they're right. spiritual. Right. But there's there's a lot of gray in that. Exactly. That, that can mean a lot of different. A lot of claims to truth and yes. gray areas and yeah. claims to uh, brands of truth. Yeah. Maybe is a way of putting it. So it's, it's, it's just, mm -hmm. it's so much in that. Um, some of that has been informed by traditional Christian beliefs mm -hmm. and practices, and then some of it are, are you know, uh, other influences. So to me, the, the challenge of, of of American Christianity is to get out of a defensive posture mm. because there's just too much history, too much truth that, you know, we have missed the ball. We, we, have, we have fallen short of the glory of God. But as Christians, we confess our sins. We're confessional people. We partake of the Eucharist, which, mm -hmm. which is always a call to self-examination. Yes. So we have to get out of this defensive posture as if we are defending uh, God. I mean, uh, the, the problem that people have is, I, I really think it's not so much with God, it's really with, with us mm -hmm. and what we have done uh, with, with the Christian religion. Mm -hmm. And if we can just own that and name that and say that we're trying to be faithful, admit the places where we have fallen short, and then say, but we are committed to, to really moving forward, that's a different place to begin uh, something new because in that gray, in that nebulous area, there are going to be some key pieces we can connect with people mm -hmm. on. People care about justice. People care about people who are suffering. Well, the Bible talks about those right. things, and that and that can be a path back to the church. Do, do you think part of the issue is that people of maybe not just conservatives, uh, but even liberals to to an extent, to put it in political context, have d have depended upon their political loyalties if they're people of faith, espouse Christian faith, that maybe we have placed our political loyalties, our religious loyalties, and, and transplanted those over into our political loyalties and have lost a part of the, our, our, our dependence upon God, or our loyalty to God. Yeah. Uh, we, we've transferred, and we, we're looking to the government to take care of things, or, or not even the government, but certain political personalities. Has, has that hurt the church, do you think? Well, I mean, you know, that's a very complex issue because right. what Christianity is so good at is enculturation. Mm -hmm. I mean, no matter where it goes, it can really enculturate itself mm -hmm. in, in ways other religions haven't been able to. So besides... Islam, and, uh, and Islam doesn't have as much history, I mean, Christianity is just good at getting in different cultures, enmeshing itself. Mm -hmm. That's both a strength and right. a weakness. that's true. So that's true. The, the weakness is that sometimes the culture can co-opt the faith. There you go. And when you really look at, let's just, let's just say the, the whole history of the Roman Empire. Mm, good uh, point. With, with yes. Christianity where the empire just 
embraces Christianity, mm -hmm. and you get um, the Roman with with the Christian, and you get Roman Catholicism, and sometimes it's hard to know where the state ends mm -hmm. and where the church begins, right. and there's a lot of painful and bad history around that, right. and eventually the Roman Empire collapses. So that's why I've been a little concerned mm -hmm. when you look at just how messy the political and the religious is, mm -hmm. and how religious leaders are so caught up into the either or of it, mm -hmm. and have completely lost the, the spiritual, uh, the otherworldly dimension of it, that they've lost objectivity completely. They're enmeshed in the very thing that, that has become problematic. Then there's almost no way out of this. And they've lost perhaps the prophetic voice. Yeah. The inability or unwillingness to speak truth to power. Yeah. When it's needed. Yeah. And so what God does is he, he goes to, to, to Tekoa and he, he'll find an Amos. Hmm. And so I think God is is ra he's raising up prophets, uh, and, and that's what I'm trying to do in, in the classroom is, mm -hmm. to, is to train students um, who can see these things and, and, and speak to these things. And How would you describe the state of the black church in America today? Very important institution in the black experience. We know that. Yeah. Uh, what, the, what, what, some of the dem what some of the studies tell us is that uh, Attendance is still pretty strong in mm -hmm. black churches. It's not quite what it used to be, right. but we're still doing, uh, you know, reasonably well. Um, pre the the black church preaching tradition is, I think, uh, incredibly vibrant mm -hmm. uh, and doing a wonderful job. We have some we have some growing edges. Mm -hmm. So a couple of a couple grow growing edges is we have so many of our leaders who are working with this sort of either or dichotomy mm. where they believe they can't speak to socio-political issues, that it's only their job to speak to spiritual issues. Mm. And so they're only trying to get souls saved, they wanna pray for people, and they wanna lead the people uh, to worship God faithfully. And that's a wonderful thing to do. Right, sure. Okay, but there, are, but there are issues going on in society that affect the people in your church, that affect the people you're mm -hmm. trying to reach in your community. And, and trying to get them educated about these issues so that they learn, so that, so that they can think about ministry both in the congregational but also in the communal context. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's been a, a growing edge, okay? That, that's been an area where we've had to really work with some pastors on. And what I've found in my work is that there's not so much resistance to that, is that that's how they had just been taught to think. Mm -hmm. that when I explained to them this holistic approach to ministry, it makes perfect sense. And then what they need are models. Well, how do I do this in, in my community? Hmm. And so um, I wrote an article in, the, um, uh, in my Black Pulpit Public Square that was called a Black Clergy Political Engagement Guide that just gives them practical things they hmm. can do Very good. to engage with political mm -hmm. leaders. You're currently teaching uh, at Simmons College and the Baptist Seminary of Kentucky a course titled The Life and Theology of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. What are some of the primary points that you're emphasizing in that class, and what's the importance, in your opinion, of that class in 2020? Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll start with the last question. Okay. I think America, America really doesn't understand King, so I wrote, mm -hmm. a, I wrote an article in a magazine last year that's called The Unknown King. Mm -hmm. that everyone knows this name, but we really don't know much about this person, and we don't understand the substance of his thought. Uh, he, he wrote so much, he made so many speeches. Uh, there are anthologies, uh, the King Papers Project. I mean, so there's just so much material out there that most people don't know anything about. So what I try to do is I try to help people to understand that this caricature is not the best way to honor the mm -hmm. legacy of Dr. King. If you really wanna honor him, then take his thinking seriously. And in order to take his thinking seriously, the second thing we need to do is to view King as an intellectual. He made a PhD in systematic theology from Boston University. Uh, he's, he's an intellectual. He should be studied uh, in every college, every university, particularly if it's a Christian or a theologically based institution. I mean, King's a theologian whose theology changed the world. Right. So that's very much from a foundational standpoint, two of the major reasons I developed this course 
And so what I try to do in the course is to situate King historically so that people understand who this man was in the 50s and 60s, what was going on in that world, what, are the, what were the systems um, at work that he was trying to challenge and mm -hmm. upend. And it's just, it's a, it's a transformative kind of class. So I really talk about that. Then we spend a lot of time just reading what he wrote, talking about his idea, his philosophy of nonviolence, um, you know, his beliefs about, about love, the beloved community. I mean, he just has wonderful, wonderful ideas. Mm -hmm. And so we, we spend a lot of time studying his thought and then circling back around to talk about now how should we understand King's mm -hmm. legacy today. This question obviously is often asked, speculative obviously. If Dr. King were still living in 2020, what do you think he would likely say to us in America today? How would he challenge us? I think King, King's work and his life ended taking up the Poor People's Campaign. Mm -hmm. So he had turned his attention to issues of poverty, right. of, re of really, uh, of classism. And so I think that King would look at the classism of America today and, and would be very, very disappointed. I don't think he would be surprised, but he would be disappointed that we, since 68, hadn't really made significant strides mm -hmm. in, in structuring ourselves in a more just way. Uh, I think King, of course, would be uh, ecstatic that y you had an African American in the White House, sure. African Americans who are in the Senate, mm -hmm. uh, Congress, who are CEOs, and there's, there's lots to celebrate uh, uh, since 68. So yeah, I think, I think he, he would see, hey man, that, that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, but then when it comes to these deeper structural issues around poverty and class, he would challenge us to take up these mm -hmm. issues. And We're down to under a minute. This is a question that a minute doesn't suffice for. But as Christians, as believers, what can we do? What should we be doing uh, to build bridges, tear down walls, to help bring people together yeah. uh, in 2020? I think, I think an, a first step is listening. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by listening is learning about other people's history. Mm -hmm. You would be surprised how learning about other people's history can help inspire in you the willingness to do what it takes to build bridges and to tear down walls. Mm -hmm. But as long as you don't understand other people's history, then you, you won't always see the need to. Mm. Very good. Dr. Lewis Brogdon, thank you so much. Oh, you're very welcome. Keep up the good work and look forward to you coming again to Campbellsville. I'm looking forward to, to this it. show. Good. This is John Chowning with Dr. Lewis Brogdon for Dialogue on Public Issues. Thank you for being with us once again.